Hello, everyone and American Library in Paris audiences and readers. I'm very pleased. I'm Rachel Donadio, the administrator of the American Library in Paris Book Award. And I'm very pleased to be speaking today with Graham Robb, one of our finalists this year about his France and Adventure History, which is a impressive book. Graham, it's really great to speak to you today. It's really nice to speak to you, Rachel. So this is a learned and loving exploration of France. It's kind of a portrait, a tapestry of a country you know so well. You've written many books about France and you're an avid cyclist. And I wanted to just ask you a little bit about the origin story of this book. How would you describe and, and explain a little bit how you, how you approach this, this history of France? Well, it was about 15 years ago that I started to wonder if it was even possible to write a history of France from the very beginning to the present or even the, even the future that would be worth reading and it wouldn't just repeat what had already been, been said. And I think it's partly because my experience of France was largely from the bicycle. So I was used to motion change the unexpected adventures. And I want to put some of that in, in a general history. And the reason it took me 15 years was that I had read lots of general histories of France, of course, uh, some of them quite brilliant. And what troubled me after reading them all was that it seemed there was a kind of kit you could buy which would contain all the necessary information, all the key facts, events, and personalities of French history. And you could then rearrange them slightly, but you were more or less just producing the same book in a, in a hopefully a better way or, or a more readable way. Um, and as I thought about it, I, the other thing that troubled me was I asked myself how much I retained from my readings. And I think being, being over generous, probably 5% of any general history, because there's only so much a human mind can contain. Um, so I think that, that was the idea behind the book, but it was also the reason it, I got excited about it. So I thought, is it possible to parachute yourself into a particular place at a particular time and become very familiar with the peculiarities of that place and time because then when I went back to the general histories I would have something real something like real physical experience to attach all, all those facts to. I think you do that so well in the book you talk about an ancient tree that was a site of pilgrimages you talk about all the Tour de France, a number, a number of things that, that we'll touch on. And you travel France by bike, but you also travel in the library and you mix the anecdotal with the historical. So you're in, in Provence and someone in a car tries to run over your wife while you're driving. And this prompts kind of musing on why is it that for centuries, Southeast France has been extremely violent? Yes, well, that's the great thing about cycling. It's, um... Well, to, to me, it's not an endurance sport. It's just the most efficient and reliable way of traveling. At the moment, at least where I am, it's more reliable than the train uh, or any other form of transport. You, really. you live on the English-Scottish border. That's right, right on the border. I, I can see the border from where I am. So I'm looking at foreign country across a river. Would that be here. Scotland? That would be Scotland. Yes, so you're which in, in, in many ways is, is closely tied to France historically um, and, and culturally. So the cycle, um, the main thing is for a historian, if you're interested in the present as well as the past, you get to talk to people. They will stop you and talk to you and you, uh, you become very familiar with the characteristics of each region. Um, and that particular event when someone um, used his car as a missile and aimed it at my wife, Margaret, uh, turned out to be a little mystery because he couldn't quite work out what the source of his um, murderous hatred was. 
uh, and that turned out to be very significant, both um, historically and um, politically in the present. So it's things like, you know, if, if it were just a travelogue, uh, just saying we went from A to B and this happened and we saw that, it wouldn't be of much interest. But it's those little glimpses into the history of France that that I really wanted to explore. So the whole one tiny little moment will explode with with all kinds of, of meaning. And it's very vivid. I think I'm trying to be kind to the reader because it is quite a long book and it's important to have something happening. And the other reason is that some of the histories I most enjoyed, they may have been written a century or two or three centuries ago. Very often it's the immediate contemporary detail that turns out to have been of historical value. You wouldn't necessarily realize it at the time. Um, an instance that can seem trivial, but that in a historical context become more significant as, as time passes. It's not a chronological book. It, it has, it's kind of episodic in a way, but did you work out why Southeast France has such a violent, you know, kind of political violence, but just so why, why, why are people so hot under the collar there? Well, one explanation, which is still given today, is it's to do with the climate and, um, you know, it's quite warm and people get hot under the collar about, about this and that. Um, but on that occasion, when we went to uh, the police station to report the, the act of violence, the, um, the local policeman explained to us that lots of different ethnic groups live there. And that goes way back to the colonization of Gaul by the ancient Greeks. And they find it difficult to get on with each other. But the... Um, once you start looking at particular examples of violence, you start to realize that this notion is largely a notion of Northern France, the old cliche of the hot-headed Southerner. Uh, they're all passionate and people in North are all, all rational and, and clear thinking. And <clears throat> of course, it depends on which period you're talking about, but Provence, like other parts of France was, colonized aggressively by Paris over a period of centuries. And that was particularly true in the Napoleonic period. Um, and that's what distinguishes France from more stable nations like the United Kingdom, that for a long time it was a collection of different principalities, sub-kingdoms and, and fiefdoms. But so that's part of that whole history. This particular man, the thing that intrigued me was I couldn't understand what he was saying. I knew he was speaking a Romance language, but it wasn't a Romance language I was familiar with. And it was only a couple of weeks later when we got back to Paris, that I realized it was Kalu, which is one of the gypsy languages of that part of Europe. And on the very day when he tried to kill my wife, <clears throat> unsuccessfully, I should say, uh, President Sarkozy had decided to expel all the Tsigan or Roma people, the gypsies, from France. So in this man's eyes, he was a young man, we were two bourgeois French people having a nice little cycling holiday in his part of the country. <clears throat> White, we're both middle class, we're both well, well off enough to have a cycling holiday. So his, his action was tied in intimately to immediate political events as well as to the history of, of Provence. Which he might have been rightly upset about in, in, in many ways. One of the things that you talk about in this book is really you know, you know more about France than so many people having having studied and written about it so much. But this is a history of France in which you haven't in some ways quite worked out what France is. And that's partly because France hasn't quite worked out what France is. And I think that you explore that in a in an interesting way. Do you think that's a fair assessment in a way? I think so. Yes, it's um, well, in England in particular, people like to generalize about the French. But um, Somebody who knows France, as you do, you know that France has lots of different subpopulations. 
And <clears throat> it's interesting that French citizens are always reminded they live in a republic. And practically everyone knows that it was founded in most recently in 1789, the French Revolution. And but that also relativizes the notion of France as a country. So when the French president says, vive la France et vive la République, he's pointing out that the Republic and the physical entity, which is France, are two separate things. And the fact that the Republics are numbered, we're currently in the fifth, shows that Republics are not eternal, they don't last forever. It's not the same as the eternal land of, of France. <clears throat> and that, that disputatiousness, which is built into the concept of a republic founded in a revolution is crucial to paradoxically a sense of French identity because that sense of identity is as as you suggest um, always changing and sometimes visibly antagonistic and it has worked quite well since the French Revolution the tension between the local and the national and or just the idea of this eternal thing called France and the political structure in place at whatever time in history. Yes, and it's different. It's different populations, uh, which also change a lot. But that's part of that goes way back in French history to before the Romans, when the Gauls said that they were founded by different populations coming from elsewhere. There's the idea that France was a, a crossroads of Western Europe, which it is really. And um, so the Gauls had a multi-ethnic view of their country, which occupied pretty much the same landmass that modern France does. This book goes from the Gauls to, not in chronological order, but to more recent developments like the Yellow Vest movement, the Gilets Jaunes. And I wonder what you made of that protest movement. You see it in a longer historical context. I, at first, I didn't know what to make of it, partly because of the way it was presented in, in the, the British press and American press. Um, so that was... Um, it's a very complex movement, like most revolutionary movements are. And it's curious that um, this has happened before, that the people who first identify a popular movement as revolutionary in the French tradition are very often the police whose job it is to, to quell it. Uh, and that's what, that's what happened in this case. They knew it was a, it was a popular revolution and that it had to be dealt with in, they thought, particularly violent ways. But the, it's it's great to see at first hand uh, a popular movement like that developing because it's very diverse in its in its early manifestations. And then gradually particular features come to the fore. In that case, one was the role of women, and that's pretty unusual really, but um, not so much in France, but um, women were absolutely central to it um, and, and still are. And the thing about, and that tends to be elided and, and removed from, from the main picture. The French Revolution, of course, we all know about the fall of the Bastille, which was mostly blokes storming a great big castle and causing lots of damage but yeah. the um the real founding event of the french revolution was the women's march on versailles and they went to versailles to bring the king and queen back to paris where where he belonged and that's what they did they occupied the national assembly they kidnapped the king and queen took him back to paris and and installed him there and that's, um, I mean, it is now recognized, but not all that widely as a more important event.
I think that's a I think that's a really important point the kind of role of 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 women and outspoken women in French history in the later chapters of the book you do talk about the women's role in in the yellow vest movement you also talk about secularism you talk about the recent spate of of murders of of women in France and and how a lot of those things intersect there's one passage in which you say the fifth republic concentrated its attacks on individual citizens its volunteer defenders targeted that sliver of the national Venn diagram, which embraces the young, the female, the minority ethnic, and the powerless. Secularism proclaimed its good intentions, but did nothing to promote integration. Its enemies were to be shamed and silenced. I thought that was a very thoughtful, synthetic look at so mm. many intersecting developments in contemporary mm. France. Well, it does show uh, the the power of the state in France does tend to be directed against scapegoats or, or particular individuals. The thing that in, in an abstract way interested me about how important women have been in not just in the Gilets Jaunes movement, but in, in other movements is that this is a, a social revolution. This is this is slightly more than 50% of the population in, in a state of revolt. And that's why it is a big threat to the state as it's currently constituted. And, and so of course for a historian, it's fascinating to see what has been a relatively rare event, relatively rare development taking place. The other thing that um that is also is is also also quite rare is the role of the the working class or what used to be the peasant class the french revolution is often thought as a revolution of the peasantry the peasantry did revolt but they were satisfied quite early on and and went home um uh, happy that the king was was reinstalled in Paris, and and so on. And then the revolution followed the normal pattern, which is that the middle classes uh, are the determining factor in the success of the revolution, and in the success of any political culture, I think. And that's yeah. something that certainly came to the fore in in. Um, in the last elections. Um, a couple other questions. I'm just curious in this long history of France and popular revolt and, and tensions between kind of religious Catholic identity and then the secular state. You know, I wonder where you see France now in its long history. I mean, which patterns of thought or administrative structure or political association do you, do you see manifesting now? Is it kind of a new phase or, or it's or this is a continuation of, of some things that we've seen for a long time? Sure. Um, That's just a small well, question I'll throw out there. <laughs> um, it's always tempt tempting to see something as new, um, but from a historical point of view, it's also tempting to be boring and say, we've seen it all before, and then to look for the, the unusual features in, in a particular event. I think, what makes it easier for a historian in France, to some extent, is that uh, I'm comparing France to Britain here, is that people are much more open in expressing their convictions, their political convictions. That rarely happens in Britain, although it's ha happened quite a lot recently when I was cycling from one end of England to the other. There were public, uh, public rational discussions of what was going on politically. But in France, the airing of views um, is quite common. Even what appear to be controversial, unpleasant views. So it's, it's great if you are, um, you don't want to deliberately interview people, but they, they will pretty much interview themselves and give you the kind of information you want. So it's, um, it's very hard to say what's 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 unusual about this particular period. Even yeah, I even, don't know. And, okay. Um, I think that, but that's another thing that frustrated me about general histories. 
was that so many of them didn't have questions. And that was one of the best ways of working out which sort of history you can trust is ask yourself, how often does the historian ask a question? Of the, and, and of, the of people, of the people around him or her? Yes. Or, and... or how often does the historian tell you what huge gaps there are in our, in our knowledge? And that was something that, um, for example, texts written by working class people uh, there's who who didn't subsequently become Parisian bourgeois are extremely rare. There is really only one long text written by a working class Frenchman that survived and that wasn't written for publication. Uh, so there's an enormous gap in our knowledge. Those gaps are very exciting. If someone tells you, we know almost nothing about this particular period, because <clears throat> it then encourages you, encourages you to look at what little we do have. And then you start to find little treasures. And of course, the scarcity of them makes them all the more valuable. To a wide ranging historical mind such as yourself. I wonder, as we <laughs> conclude, would you say that this book, An Adventure History, France, An Adventure History, would, do you feel it has a thesis? Is there a statement that you are making about, about France in this thoughtful collection of, of different historical moments and characters and places? There, well, there is a general thesis in that it tries not to have a general thesis, but that's partly because um, when, it, when I'm writing a book, I just feel that I'm writing for anyone who might want to read it or be interested in the subject. <clears throat> and that's what makes it easy being a writer, because even though most of the time you're in solitary confinement, you feel very sociable. Because you feel you're, you're communicating with, with lots of people and you don't, you don't have to know who they are. Um, so it's, I think, you know, the, the one thesis was to try to prevent the reader from developing a thesis too soon. And once again, thinking about the country I live in, um, people will say, oh, the French are like this, or the French are like that, or they'll say, France is, is, is so good, it's wasted on the French, and things like that. And, um, so I was trying to bypass that assumption that there are characteristics shared by all French people. And that's quite easy to do because I'm living in a country called the United Kingdom, but just across the river, there's foreign country where they're different. <laughs> exactly. Is there anything else that you think that readers should take away from France and adventure history or anything else you would like to add for American Library? and Paris audiences out there? Well, um, one thing is that if you, I'm not really an evangelical cyclist because to me, it's just the, my normal mode of transport. We don't have a car, but it is a great way to see France. And because you go slowly and you see things and you remember things, it's as though there's a disc being recorded in your brain. So you, your recall of particular places seems to be enhanced by the, the act of turning the pedals. And people often feel that you are seeing France the way it ought to be seen. There's kind of nostalgia attached to the, the bicycle. And especially when you arrive at a hotel or in a restaurant, chefs love you because they know you're gonna have a great appetite whatever local food they care to put in front of you. <laughs> there you go. Well, France and adventure history on the shortlist for this year's American Library in Paris annual book award. Graham Robb, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure for me too, Rachel. Thank you.